To all of you at the World Materials Forum, I'm Robert Friedland. You probably remember me speaking uh, to the forum on the subject of uh, battery raw materials and metals in previous years. I'm here as a guest of Victoire de Marjorie and uh, Philippe Ferrin and His Excellency the, the Mayor of Nancy here in France. I've been living in Singapore for 25 years. I'm living on an island that has managed to control the COVID-19 virus. Uh, we've gotten it down here in the general population where we only have zero or one or two, three cases per day. At enormous effort on the part of the Singaporean government and population. The pandemic is uh, clearly a seminal event in our life. For example, uh, for the last five or 10 years, media was only concerned with Islamic radicalism, worried about Al Qaeda, uh, and that's all gone. It's all forgotten. It's all about uh, the pandemic around the clock. And we're still perhaps in the early stages of it. We don't know whether there'll be a efficacious vaccine or whether in fact there will not be an efficacious vaccine. So we're learning to live with it and we're thinking a lot about what the world would be like post this virus phase. But there are radically different outcomes in different parts of the world in response to the exact same virus. Radically different outcomes. As you know, it affects different elements in any human population quite differently. It seems to largely bounce off of younger people, even though they can transmit it easily to more elderly people or people with a compromised immune system. It's amazing to a lot of observers how well, in general, the African continent has done with the virus. That's a continent that has had a lot of experience with infectious disease and has done remarkably well in many countries at the containment of the virus. There doesn't seem to be a mathematical correlation between how rich a country is and how well it does with the virus. There's a lot of countries with a very low GDP and superb response to the virus. For example, Mongolia, sandwiched between China and Russia, has had cases that you can count on one or two hands. A remarkably effective response in isolation, social distancing, testing. Whereas very rich places like Texas or Florida or California have had enormous problems. One of the most interesting things is the global nature of the virus. It's on all continents, all the way down to Antarctica, all the way up near the North Pole. So this virus has a huge impact on humanity, and we're still early in trying to understand its impact. It's been found virtually everywhere. Our response to that as a species is really causing us to remind ourselves we all live on one little tiny blue dot hurtling through space, seven billion of us all occupying the same spaceship and all affected by the same factors. I'm talking to you now in the late summer of 2020, it's an open question whether there's going to be an efficacious vaccine or not. Of course, one would hope there will be. We don't have a vaccine for the common cold, and we don't have a vaccine for HIV, despite trying for 40 years. So right now, it's down to the simple essentials, soap and water, hand washing, distancing, testing, testing, and testing, isolation of people, and protection of those elements of society that are vulnerable. And a maniacal focus on these basics actually works. The denial of these basics guarantees that it keeps coming back. In fact, everybody has underestimated this virus from the very beginning. We're very early in trying to understand the multiplicity of psychological and economic impacts. Obviously, the world has been dealt a huge deflationary shock. The initial response is deflationary. The monetary response is an enormous amount of money printing. And in fact, central banks don't even print money anymore. In the old days, they used to print it on a printing press. 
Now it's just a digital entry on a computer. Just tap the zero key and create more money. This enormous amount of money being created is starting to have its reflections in the financial markets. Stock markets are flying in the United States because shares represent real things. You can't print a Walmart store or an Amazon fulfillment center. And you see a huge increase in the price of certain raw materials needed to respond to the pandemic. You've seen an explosion in the price of companies that make rubber gloves or make precursor chemicals for vaccines or biotechnology companies or whatever it is we think we need to respond as a species. I'm very happy to be able to address the audience sitting in Singapore, where we also worry about what raw materials we're going to need in a future world. The same subjects that are discussed at the World Materials Forum in Nancy, France every year are a huge subject of interest here in Singapore, where we have Tomasic, and we have uh, GIC, Government of Singapore Investment Corporation, and we have an explosion of technology companies here. Mr. Dyson, who revolutionized the vacuum cleaner and the hair dryer, makes his vacuum cleaners here in Singapore. And those vacuum cleaners have compact, powerful electric motors. There are rare earth, sophisticated metals and alloys in those electric motors. And when he makes a better hair dryer, billions of people in the world want a better hair dryer. When he makes a better vacuum cleaner, billions of people in the world want a better vacuum cleaner. The World Materials Forum has become a leading forum to bring industry leaders together and to think about the raw material supply chain and more importantly, what raw materials we're going to need five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, in a different world, in a better world. What raw materials we need to transfer and improve the entire supply chain to address global warming. You know, one of the most intricate and complicated things for the average human being to contemplate is the supply chain. Everything in your life, where does it come from? How did you get to touch it? When you walk into a room, all of us are guilty of having turned on a light switch. Nobody's thinking about the fact that there's no storage of electrical energy in the grid. The moment you turn on that light switch, Somewhere, a generator has to kick in and send the electricity to you. Nobody's thinking about where that power comes from, how it was generated, and the fact that just by turning on that light switch, you're adding to global demand. In America, a typical person thinks a ham sandwich comes from a refrigerator, but the ham sandwich does not come from a refrigerator. It comes from maybe 30 million pigs a month being slaughtered in a river of blood outside downtown Chicago in Illinois, and then slicing those poor little pigs in little slices. A lot of those workers are probably getting COVID-19, by the way. And then that sandwich ends up in the refrigerator. We don't really think about the supply chain of food. We don't think about the supply chain of gasoline or hydrocarbon or electrical energy or any of the daily necessities of our life. Everybody just stopped thinking about the supply chain. And really, when you start to have incipient green or environmental consciousness arising all over the world, especially in younger people, and I'm not talking about Generation X, I'm talking about millennials or younger, they're not really taught anything about the supply chain in school. In fact, the whole concept of a supply chain is rather alien. So everything you touch originated with mining or it originated in agriculture. And these two basic enterprises of mining and agriculture go back to the dawn of us evolving from primates. 
what do we need to change the world? What raw materials do we need? And how do we organize those raw materials to lessen the wealth disparity between seven billion humanoids that occupy this planet? And how do we do that without having a deleterious effect on all the other equally valid life forms? For example, the marine animals in the sea. One of the greatest transformations industrially that's happening is this crazy iron horse, the machine that replaced the horse, the automobile. So the transformation of the automobile is just one element of disruption. When you change automobiles, you change the whole energy supply chain because for the last hundred years, automobiles have primarily burned oil, gasoline, hydrocarbon. It's a really, really big one. It's not the only one. You start thinking about, well, it's not just cars. How about scooters, motorcycles, buses, trucks? All of them are changing. Everything about the way we generate electrical energy and the way we transmit that energy is very dependent on only a few elements in the periodic table. And we have only one periodic table to work with in this known universe. Not all of the elements conduct electrical energy. Nickel and copper and gold and silver and platinum and palladium, there are limited elements that are excellent conductors of electrical energy. And basically, if you study human progress, all of us consume more electrical energy per person than the previous generation. In a typical American or European home now, people have 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 items that use electrical energy. A lot of people, when they go to sleep at night, leave their computer on, or they leave their handphone on. Even if that handphone is powered by a battery, it's gonna to have to be recharged. So we're using more and more electrical energy. Here in Singapore, which was really founded by a revolutionary, Lee Kuan Yew, who started this state, he said the greatest invention of the last century was the air conditioner. Without an air conditioner, I can assure you that beautiful city behind me would not exist. I mean, this place is really warm and humid. You couldn't have this beautiful city without air conditioning. There is no known air conditioning technology that isn't energy intensive and uses copper. Everybody's not living like Singapore. Singapore enjoys one of the highest living standards in the world. Now, how many people are there in the world today that want an air conditioner? India or Africa or South America or Brazil? So just air conditioning demand alone, just that one issue is gonna consume astronomic amounts of electrical energy and also the copper and the aluminum to generate and transmit that energy. Elon Musk wants to put a man on Mars. Great idea. Or a woman on Mars. Great idea. Complicated though, it'll take a lot of work but you're not going to get there without mining scandium and aluminum right here on planet Earth to make the scandium aluminum alloy to make that rocket. And that's the kind of a thing we need as a species to find. We need to find bigger and better sources of all metals, of copper, of platinum, or any other metal you care to think about for the technological transformation we've been talking about. Central banks have already made money free around the world. We're experiencing the lowest interest rates on money right now, as I'm talking to you today, for the last 10,000 years. Even in ancient Egypt or Rome or Greece or in the Middle Ages, we didn't have negative interest rates. We've never seen a situation like in Japan where you put a billion dollars in the bank and a year later you only have $999 million negative interest rates. So central banks have done what they can to reduce the cost of money. Plan B for governments is to stimulate the economy with bridges, roads, airports, highways, hyperloops, electric cars, new everything, that financial stimulation. 
That is what's bringing us back to raw material demand. Like, what are we going to do? Are we going to build more internal combustion engines to dig ourselves out of this hole we've dug for ourselves? Of course not. We're looking for a better way. There's a plethora of new materials under development to change the world. And there's an enormous amount of interest the arising in people about changing the world. Let's roll with the punch of COVID-19 and look at taking this incredible forum onto the World Wide Web. Let's get it set up so everybody in the world can attend it. Let's use this year to think a little bit differently. And let's use this year to think out of the box. And let's use this year to take the very interesting intellectual property developed at this year's and previous year's World Materials Forum, let's take it global. Let's explain to everybody that disruptive technology needs new materials. It could be graphene. It could be a new way to use carbon to make graphene or graphite. It could be hydrogen fuel cells. It could be platinum for the proton exchange membrane. It could be nickel or cobalt in electric car batteries. This year with the COVID-19 virus, let's maintain a little bit of social distancing until we have a vaccine. Let's look at the positive aspects of the COVID-19 virus. Let's look at the fact that we have to think about a better way to do things. And let's find a way to use our human connections and broaden it. We all love to go to the beautiful city of Nancy in France. I can assure those of you who haven't been there, it is an incredibly beautiful city. Let's give our thoughts to his honor, the mayor, who has given us the magnificent location in Nancy, and to our co-founders, Philippe Verin and Victoire de Marjorie, two of my best friends who I hold in the highest possible regard. I love what Victoire and Philippe put together. It's a huge honor to address you. Thank you for allowing me to be an introductory to the entire conference, sort of a keynote speaker. God willing, I'll be back next year with wheels on. I will have flown there and physically attended. By then I'm hoping to have been vaccinated so I don't have to wear a mask and give you a virus. But in the meantime, let's keep the dialogue going. So with that, I say uh, merci bien, a bientôt, and see you next year. Thank you. Mm -hmm.